And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker this morning. He's a talented writer, a photographer, a teacher, and an ardent seeker of truth. Please join me in welcoming Reverend Michael Record to deliver this morning's message. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, Reverend Maxwell. Practitioner Jennifer Livingston, thank you so much for that introduction. Let me add my own words of welcome to those at this morning's service, which is radiating from the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica. A hearty greeting to you all here in the church with me, as well as those listening online. It's a beautiful day. We've been having really nice weather recently, ever since I started preparing this talk. I wonder if there is a causal relationship. Did my thoughts affect the weather? You know that our de Declaration of Principles do state that we can control conditions through the power of mind. More on that later. The good weather has put me in a good frame of mind. A poetic frame of mind. So you'll hear a lot of poetry in my talk, which is titled, Of Poetry and Purpose. It is about science of mind, the name of our teaching. One of the many benefits of the COVID pandemic is that it has forced us in this center in Jamaica to use online communications more for services and classes, for example. So newcomers to the teaching could be listening to me in faraway countries, Australia, Brazil, Cameroon, Denmark, England, A, B, C, Z, E, and all the other names down the alphabet, perhaps. For the benefit of any newcomers, a little lab background of religious science. Its conceptualizer, Ernest Holmes, started this metaphysical teaching about a hundred years ago in the United States. He formally founded a religious science institute in 1927 in Los Angeles. His magnum opus, a large 646-page book called The Science of Mind, has an introduction comprising four chapters. The thing itself, the way it works, what it does, and how to use it. These four chapters provide the essence of the book. And here is the essence of those four chapters. The thing itself is the universal, omnipresent mind we call God. The way it works is by working through us in a law-governed way. What it does? It creates, demonstrates, or manifests, if you wish, the conditions in our lives. And how do we use it? We use it by thinking into it. More on that later. By the way, that summary was to entice you to read the book, not to deter you from reading all 646 pages. It'll change your life for the better, I promise. As I said, my title is Of Poetry and Purpose, and here is my poem about purpose. It's called To Do Today. End a Quarrel. 
write a letter. Tell P, sorry. Help a beggar. Keep that promise. Give a smile. Say, I love you. Walk a mile. Rake the driveway. Own my wrong. Renew a friendship. Sing a song. Forgive my neighbor. Buy a flower. Go out for lunch. Take things slower. Get home early. Phone my dad. Work in garden. Thank you, God. Earlier, I broached the subject of my thoughts affecting the weather. Let me elaborate on the relevant clause in religious science's Declaration of Principles about mental control of conditions. One clause says that God operates through a universal mind, which is the law of God. It says we are surrounded by that mind, as if we were vegetable, vegetables in a soup or fish in the ocean. Please note, that imagery is mine. It is not in the Declaration. The clause continues, declaring that mind is creative, in that it receives the direct impress of our thoughts and acts upon it. In other words, when we think, the mental substance around us, the equivalent of the soup or water, reacts to our thinking and the conditions around us change. That is why the clause that follows later can read, we believe in the control of conditions through the power of this mind. Now, what is meant by the general word conditions? It could mean the weather. And Jesus controlled the weather, remember? He stopped a squall at sea by saying, peace, be still. And according to the Bible, his disciples were amazed and said, What manner of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey him. Conditions could also refer to a person's physical condition. And again, the Bible tells us that Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. Conditions could also mean the physical makeup of material things. And here, we recall that Jesus' first miracle was changing water into wine. You may say, that was Jesus. He was not an ordinary man. But then, not only did he tell his disciples that they would do works as mighty as his, but the disciples actually did them. They too healed the sick and raise the dead, the Bible tells us. <clears throat> now, the doubting Thomases among us, or maybe I should say the scientific-minded among us, might say, perhaps those Bible stories are parables. Or they might say, that was then, this is now. What happened in biblical times don't happen now. My response to that latter objection is this. Why wouldn't miracles still happen today when we know that God has not changed in 2,000 years? And nature hasn't changed. The days are still 24 hours long. The sun still rises in the east. Storms still occur at sea. Now, I'll address the suggestion that perhaps the Bible, the Bible miracles are parables, fictional stories to teach a lesson. Of course, we know the Bible is full of parables. But I want you to consider two words which fundamentally mean the same thing. Coincidence and synchronicity. Both refer to two or more events happening together 
overlapping, perhaps, or being side by side, apparently by chance, but linked significantly in some way. The difference between, between them really is up to the observer. If the linking of the events isn't of any importance to you, you tend to call it coincidence. However, if the linking is, is important and favorable to you, you call it synchronicity and believe there is a causal connection. Here are examples I got from an online search for the word synchronicity. You met someone out of the blue who talked about an event or said th some things which sounded like answers to questions that you had been think asking yourself recently. Or perfect timing, things happen for you just when you need them most. Or a third, help and support appear in your life from people you didn't expect to give it or people you never met before. Those are examples online. Now, here are some examples of either coincidence or synchronicity you choose in connection with the writing of this particular talk. A couple of weeks ago, when I decided my subject matter would be the importance of having a purpose or vision or intention, same thing, in one's life, I needed 20 minutes of material. One of the first things I do when I turn on my computer in the morning is to read the thought for today. You see, daily for the past dozen years or so, this church has published an inspirational thought online. It pops up at midnight every morning. I've watched it pop up. On the morning I started writing this talk, which is late last month, the thought for today was by Elizabeth Terry, a member of the center. Her affirmation was, I quote, I am a center for the distribution of God's good and its bounty returns to me, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, unquote. That quote gave me the first bit of material I needed, since it expresses Elizabeth's purpose in life. So after writing for some hours, I stopped until Thursday last. That day, George Jr. Young's thought for today was also about purpose. He, he wrote, I am putting my life in order through silence, prayer, and meditation, and I'm readily accepting all the good that is coming to me now, unquote. Elizabeth's purpose is to be a distribution of God's good, and Junior's purpose is to receive God's good. Notice the powerful I am phrase that both begin their affirmation with. You might not think those things are important enough to be called synchronicities, just coincidences, though they did help me, so I might have a different view. But I'm not done. On Friday morning, day before yesterday, at about 8 o'clock, just as I was preparing to meditate, the phone rang. It was an overseas call from a woman who told me that she happened on my number by chance while looking online for prayer support. Now, of the millions of phone numbers in the world, she found my number. The call meant I could provide her with prayer and advice, and she could provide me with more material for this talk. The woman said her husband had abandoned her for another woman, 
leaving her with three teenage sons and a full-time job. She had no family nearby to turn to for support. So we spoke about her two favorite songs, 23 and 91, and we agreed that both are about God supporting us in times of trouble. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's from the 23rd Psalm. And from the 91st, she read, she read it all to me, this couple of verses. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone." Unquote. My contention is that my thoughts and those of Liz Terry, Junior Young, and the woman who phoned me, whose name I won't disclose, of course, commingled in the one universal mind which we all use to think. My intention, I maintain, influenced the events mentioned. I hope you are convinced by now that even today, thoughts can influence conditions, as they did 2,000 years ago when Jesus commanded the waves and the ocean to be still. You're not yet convinced? Okay. One more bit of evidence. Around noon on Friday, while I was writing the talk, the phone rang again. It was Angela Ed Elliott, our musical director. She phoned me to tell me that Madre Paris, who you'll be hearing shortly, would be singing the musical item. Guess what the hymn they chose was? Be Thou My Vision. Vision is, of course, a synonym for purpose. I had not made any arrangement with either Angela or Margaret to sing about purpose. But just around the time I was deciding on this topic, they were deciding on that hymn. You surely believe by now that thoughts affect conditions. If you do, the implications for your life are tremendous. These examples of synchronicity are narrowly related to this talk. But I could go wider and further back in time to a talk of mine, for example, titled Reverend John's Banana. Interesting title, right? So you'll be disappointed to hear that it is about an actual banana. One Saturday morning, I forgot to take a banana to church to eat during our regular minister's meeting. While the others were drinking coffee, I would be eating my banana. I don't drink coffee. When I got to the church, to my surprise, Reverend John presented me with a banana. We had been having those meetings, those ministers' meetings, for years, and he had never brought the banana to me for me before. He was always only coming up for the others. He told me he had actually got to his car. When he got this strong feeling, he should go back and get a banana for me. Or I could tell you, of asking a passerby on the street of New York City how to get to a particular theater and how another passerby told us that he was heading there and I should follow him. That one man out of the eight million people in New York City passed at the exact moment I asked the question. 
I could give you many more personal examples, and I could even give you more examples from the lives of other people, but I won't. You all have experienced similar synchronicities. You know in your heart that your thoughts can influence conditions, including influencing other people's thoughts. Unfortunately, of course, some of us forget and we think negative thoughts which influence us negatively. The law of attraction is exact. That is why Ernest Holmes could state, I quote, if any thought is negative, then, uh, I'm sorry, if any thought is creative, then all thoughts are creative. So the question facing us is this, how can I control my thoughts so that they create positive conditions in my life at every moment and in every way I want? Now for most people, most of the time, I suspect, this would involve controlling other people's thinking. Most people, I believe, would want other people to give them gifts like money and cars and houses and do things for them like work. The way my desire for a banana caused Reverend John to bring one for me. But I ask you, think about it. Would that be a good thing? The woman who phoned me on Friday wanted to control her husband's thoughts in some way. I wasn't clear if she wanted him to come back to her or to spend more time with the children or to stop walking around in public with his new girlfriend. It embarrassed her, she said. But I told her that just as she would not want him to control her mind, she should not want to control his mind. I said that we are here on earth to do what we individually want, to self-actualize, as Abraham Maslow puts it, not to be or do what somebody else wants. Think about it. Do you really want people in your life to give you everything you desire? Such a life would be not only boring, but you wouldn't be able to build character, muscle, or backbone. You'd be like a jellyfish. Who really wants that? Extrapolating from that, we should consider if we really want to control all conditions in our lives simply by the power of our thoughts. That question I will probably explore in another talk, but this one is not about what your purpose should be, whether you should be a lawyer, doctor, or Indian chief, but about the importance of having a purpose, a vision, principles to guide you in whatever your career or vocation you choose. I'm saying that it's important to go places, but I'm not telling you the places you'll go. Oh, that phrase is the title of a famous Dr. Zeus poem, and it is time for another poem. It's a rather long poem, so here are just the first few stanzas of, oh, the places you'll go. Congratulations! Today is your day. You are off to great places. You are off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You are on your own and you know what you know. And you are the one who will decide where to go. You look up and down streets. Look them over with care. About some you'll say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, 
you are just too smart to go down any not so good streets. And you may not find any you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener there in the wide open air. Out there things can happen and frequently do to people as brainy and footsy as you. And when things start to happen, don't worry, don't stew. Just go right along. You'll start happening too. And it goes on, this lovely, thoughtful, thought-provoking poem, which I connect to the Greek philosopher Socrates, who some 2,500 years ago said, one should know the purpose of one's life. His observation, an unexamined life is not worth living, is published in writings by a student of Socrates, Plato. The writings are called The Apology of Socrates, and it contains Plato's recollections of Socrates' last speeches. One online writer says of the phrase, the unexamined life, that it refers to a life lived by ropes under the rules of others without the subject ever examining whether or not he or she truly wants to live with those routines or rules. According to Socrates, says this writer, this type of life was not worth living. Rather than living an unexamined life, Socrates chose death by suicide. I like the interpretation given by another online writer, Dr. Colin Cavendish Jones, who writes that Socrates chose death rather than life under the delusion and folly in which most people live. I quote, For Socrates, the point of being human is to practice philosophy, to question everything. If one does not take advantage of the opportunities afforded by having a reasoning, questioning brain, then one might as well be an animal or even a vegetable, for that matter. One might as well be dead. But Dr. Cavendish Jones says that the statement could also mean that Socrates was saying that the examined life is worth living. This is an inspiring message, he says, and I quote, since it makes the meaning of life dependent not on the world or on God, but on you. If you use your ability to think and reason, to examine your life and decide what is good about it and what you want to do with it, then your life has meaning. And since the meaning lies in the examination itself, then paradoxically, even if you find no meaning in life or in your life, you have created some just by searching for it. That I find a, quite an interesting interpretation of Socrates' statement. And Socrates would probably have agreed with Ralph Waldo Emerson who said, I quote, the purpose of life is not to be happy, it is to be useful, to be honorable, to be compassionate, to have it make a difference. Going even further back in history than Socrates, I'll quote the anthropologist Sir Lawrence van der Post, writing a, in a book on the Bushmen of the Kalahari in Africa, indicating that the tribe thinks, thinks along the same lines as Emerson, he writes that to the Bushman, I quote, there's only one thing that makes human beings deeply and profoundly bitter, and that is to have thrust upon them a life without meaning. There's nothing wrong in searching for happiness, but a far more comfort to the soul is something greater than happiness or unhappiness, and that is meaning. Once you have meaning, it's irrelevant whether you are happy or unhappy. You have contentment in your spirit, unquote. 
and according to Mahatma Gandhi, I quote, the purpose of life is undoubtedly to know oneself. We cannot do it unless we learn to identify ourselves with all that lives. The instrument of this knowledge is boundless, selfless service, unquote. I refer to those four sets of people to show that the wiser heads throughout time and across various cultures believe that every human being should have a purpose in life. It follows then that those who don't have a purpose are not the wiser heads, shall we say. So now, if you are convinced that you should have a purpose, and additionally that your purpose, your intention, your vision, choose your words, can influence the conditions around you, what are you going to do starting now? I'm sure you're going to try to develop a consciousness that will attract positive things, people, and events into your life. I use the general word consciousness because it takes in both the conscious and the subconscious working of the mind. Both levels, both the, con the conscious level and the subconscious level, both of them affect your purpose, intention, and vision. Specifically, Starting now, you will pray and meditate, two very powerful ways of developing the consciousness you need. And you will also, as far as you can, in your daily life, think positive thoughts all the time. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I conclude with one of my poems about consciousness. It's titled, unity consciousness. We are the branches of one tree, the fingers of one hand, the voices of one choir, one seashore's sand. We are the steps of one dance, the minutes of one hour, the people of one world drops in a shower. We are the pages of one book, the rays of one sun, the notes of one melody, words of a song. We are the thoughts of one mind, the leaves of one bough, the waves of one ocean, moments of now. We are the trees of one forest, the seeds of one pod, the children of one creator, which is God. Namaste.